All right, so this is Robert with the Space Coast Rocket. We are at our studios here in Melbourne, uh, close to downtown Melbourne, and we are blessed today to have our congressional candidate for United States Congress, uh, Sandy Kennedy. Sandy Kennedy, uh, who's running to replace Congressman Bill Posey, who earlier announced his retirement uh, from office. Uh, welcome to the studio, Sandy. Thank you. Thank Are you excited? You. I'm very excited to be here and tell everyone about my campaign. Um, my name is Sandra D. Kennedy. You can find me online. I have a LinkedIn bio. Um, I go by Sandy. Um, I, I'm a native Floridian. I've been a lawyer for almost 30 years. I'm a construction lawyer and um, I practice construction law. I help subcontractors get paid their contract balances when they've not been paid and also defend them against construction defects and design defects. Um, and I'm board certified in that for the past 17 years, which means that I met a higher standard of practice and my ethics are higher, my subject knowledge is better. Um, and um, I'm a native Floridian. I was born in Panama City, Florida at Tyndall Air Force Base. Okay, Panhandle. Um, yep, and I grew up in an Air Force family, uh, traveled as a child, but you know, always came back to Florida, and I've lived in Florida for about 40 years, more than 40 years. Um, part of the time of my childhood was on a NATO Air Force Base in Southern Italy. Oh, wow. And various other Air Force bases. Married kids? I am married. I have a 20-year-old son who will be turning 21 this year, and he's adorable. One of the loves of my life. <laughs> okay. And what made you decide to take on this, this role to run for Congress? Well, um, being a lawyer and having a political science degree I've always had an interest in running for office, um, but I am a member of the working class. I had to have financial security. I've always supported myself for you know most of my life. Um, I started working when I was 16, and I did not have the luxury to stop work for a period of time to run for office. Um, I do now <laughs> because during the pandemic, I kind of joined the great resignation and decided, recently decided, you know, now's the time. There's a lot going on that um, our rights are being eroded, people are hurting, um, finances are getting really hard, and I, I just think I don't like the trajectory of things, and I just decided, you know, it's a, it's a tough district to run in, but I want to do it. Things are getting very polarized, polarizing and divisive um, in politics, national politics and state politics. Um, as a registered Democrat in, in Brevard County, which encompasses all of the congressional district that you're running for, how do you see yourself, number one, overcoming the registered voter difference, and number two, bringing the parties together, kind of reaching across those party lines to kind of get rid of some of that divisiveness? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, you know, everybody asks, what do you think is the biggest interest of the people of District 8? And I honestly believe that this community has got a lot of very diverse interests. Um, I, I believe, I know that a, a large, large number of us across the line, Republican, Democrats, independents, are very concerned about abortion. This issue um, taking away the rights to health care of such a huge segment of the population is just untenable for large numbers of people. This brings us together. Um, Democrats are the only ones who are offering this right now, and I believe I'm electable, and I will work very, very hard to ensure that we can codify abortion rights. Um, and you know, it's, it's very important because people didn't know. I mean, I really honestly believe that when they went down the path of abortion bans, they did not realize how they were going to affect people's health care. So people need to not just dig in and believe that they did it and now they're going to stick to it. They need to reverse course, back up, and, 
you know, recognize that we have to make sure that women live first and, and that they're healthy and that when they have a simple health issue, if it does require an abortion, that they're able to get it to protect not just their life at the moment right before they might die, but to protect their health long before they get there. So that's that's one thing is this abortion, this abortion issue, putting it on the ballot to have an abortion right in the Florida Constitution is very important. Um, likewise, the uh, legal, legalizing marijuana um, amendment is very important for bringing people together. Um, and I'm in favor of both of those amendments. Um, I don't think marijuana is such a serious drug as it's been treating, as, treated as being in the past. And we really need to just decriminalize it and allow people to possess it. Even though I'm really not in favor of people doing more marijuana, I just don't want people being processed criminally because of it. Right, so obviously the, uh, I think the DEA recently came out, it was either the DEA or the FDA about reclassifying uh, you know, marijuana as a, a lower scheduled drug. Um, so you're for not necessarily the legalization, but the decriminalization, is that correct? Uh, no, I'm, I think you have to legalize it to okay. decriminalize it. Right. Um, yeah. So I am in favor of legalizing it. Okay. Um, I'm just saying that I just I don't smoke pot, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I am in favor of people being free and having the freedom to do something that is not as dangerous as it has been passed off as being. Um, and if I could go back and answer the rest of your sure. question, you were asking, you know, how would I overcome the large numbers of Republicans? And what I want to say is we all have such a great diversity of interests. And Republicans, if you ask them, will say, you know, guns are very important to them. Smaller government is important. Um, states' rights. But I really ask if you reach into your heart, think about it. Think about what is really important to you. You're, you're interested in also in veterans, protecting veterans. You're concerned about Social Security. It being there, you put the money into it. Right. Most people don't have a huge amount of money in District 8. Social Security is still important for most of the people in District 8. Medicare is important. Um, Health care is very important, and health care costs are through the roof. The only way you get all of these issues taken care of and more issues taken care of is through a Democrat who's not the one trying to have small government. Now, why are Republicans trying to have small government? Because Republicans have gone down a path of lowering taxes, lowering, lowering, lowering. It worked starting back in the 60s. This is why everybody was in love with John F. Kennedy. Lowered the no higher... Question. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I'm working very hard to find oh, out. Yeah, there are yeah. so many Kennedys. Most of them had about a dozen to 25 children oh, wow. each wow. and it's very hard to trace that family it's yeah. a huge family so um anyhow in the past we used to have higher tax rates um in the 50s when a single person could support a family of four um the tax rate the upper tax rate on the very wealthiest of the wealthiest was 92 percent and then Kennedy brought it down to 72% and everybody was ecstatic. The economy got better. Yes, it did. Taxes were too high back then. But it's gone lower and lower and lower. And now the effective rate is somewhere in the 20s. And we have a progressive tax system where your tax dollars that mean so much at the bottom are taxed lower, and as you become a billionaire, a multi-billionaire, your tax rate goes up. And that's why it must go up, because those dollars don't mean that much to those people, and that's why it must go up. When that is taxed appropriately, we can afford to take care of all the needs of government. Um, education, everybody is interested in better education. Nobody wants their kids in bad schools. That can be done when we're taxing the highest level at an appropriate rate. Um, Social Security would be more secure overnight if 
the contributions that they pay, if contributions would go above, say, 168000 which is about where it is now, um, Social Security would be secure overnight. Um, roads, taking care of roads and bridges. There's a list in every single state of the number of roads and bridges that are close to collapse, and we've got a lot of them here in Florida. With more taxes we from the upper echelon, which is not paying its fair share right now, we can afford to do all of these things that Republicans want done, that independents want done, and that Democrats want done. Things across the board for everybody. And pay down the national debt because it that's got to be done too. Um, uh, just being financially responsible is important in the national debt to make sure we're not passing off a disaster to our children. That's got to be done too. But the higher taxes on the upper echelon has got to be done first and foremost. You're, you're answering a lot of my questions without me even having to ask them. So you know, <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, back on to the, um, the, uh, what was the issue? I, just, I should have wrote it down. Oh, veterans. Um, with, with the veterans, you know, the, Brevard County has a very high population of, of veterans, um, retired military. We also have the Space Force Base here. I'm still getting used to saying that instead of Patrick Air Force Base, Space Force Base. But, um, you know, what do you see your, yourself, you know, as a representative here providing uh, to the, the veterans here at a federal level? Well, that security and certainty of support that they need. Um, triggering that money to come in so that we can fund to a significant extent what they need. It's only fair that we do this. My own father um, was paid at a very low rate because, you know, I think they allow, or at least back then, they allow you to opt what you're, how you're going to get paid, whether you're going to get paid very little now so that as you get older, you'll be paid more or, but any way you look at it, they were supposed to be taken care of medically completely. And that is a big failure in a promise that really needs to be upheld to people that are putting themselves on the line to, to take care of us. Um, so that's what I want to do and to definitely be available to them. You know, in canvassing and going around, I actually met a man the other day who, um, when he word, I heard I was running for Congress, He's like, you are going to win and you're going to be my representative. And he was ecstatic. He was a veteran and he was telling me about how hard it was to get health care and get his benefits. And sometimes he just asks and asks and can't get anyone to help him. Yeah, as a veteran myself, a retired army, I can tell you that the frustration and VA are synonymous. You know, so we definitely need somebody who can help get in there and, and try to get this program to be much more efficient than it is because veterans definitely need, need the services. Uh, we talked about education briefly. Uh, one of the points that a lot of conservatives at the federal level uh, are focusing on is the abolishment of the Department of Education. What, what is your position on, on DOE and where it should be used? I believe we need the Department of Education. Absolutely. I mean, this is another part of Republicans' plans to collapse government, and literally they have said they wanna drown it in a bathtub. We need government. We need good government. In order to be the best nation in the world that we are, we have to have government of a size big enough to take care of all the people. We just cannot pretend that things are going, that life is going to be that we're going to have a high standard of life if we don't have a reasonably sized government. Um, public education is very important. We don't want a situation where the great majority of kids going to school are learning next to nothing so that they can become serfs for the oligarchy. That is not the nature of our government. This is capitalism. We're supposed to have a system where those who work the hardest get paid the most. And we don't even have that right now. Right now we've got a system of the people are getting paid less and less and less, and the wealthier are making more and more and more. And the billionaires are soon going to become trillionaires. We're on a path that within our lifetime soon, we're going to see the world's first trillionaire. 
And it's all because of taxes. It's all because we're not taxing them enough. It just needs to get back, you know, being conservative, I've heard it being defined as keeping things the way they are or restoring the way things used to be. Well, we need to restore taxation to the way it used to be. Maybe not back in the 50s or the 60s, but somewhere back there, there was a good scheme of taxation that was allowing the people in the country to pay for what they needed to. And to get back to answering your question, the Department of Education is just very important because if if the, the great majority of the people are not getting a decent education, then we can't become that great nation where capitalists are out there doing great things. I've always found it somewhat ironic when we hear people who are calling for smaller government, those people are usually running for office. Yeah, so yes, because you know what the people running for office get out of smaller government is they are doing a favor for the people who have so much money. They're basically pandering to them. So they're looking for jobs. They're looking for benefits, positions, fame, um, and campaign donations. And that's why we need campaign finance reform. Yeah, let's talk about the campaign finance reform a little bit. Before we started talking, um on camera here, you were talking about the need for some of the campaign finance reform. What's your position, like what are your ideas about how we reform camp campaign finance? Well, what I would like to do is um, propose a bill, work on a bill, write a bill, which as a lawyer I'm capable of doing, <laughs> um, that includes election fairness and unifying and standardizing election law across the states, not to take it away from the province of the states, but to at least unify it so that people feel that there's a greater sense of fairness. Everything is being done the same. Nobody's getting an unfair advantage. Um, everything's been analyzed by experts and by bipartisan committees um, so that there's a consistent deadline and you know by when you need to have things done so that you can have your candidates on the ballot so that this state won't take a person off the ballot and then this one say, well, they did it, now I'm going to do it, as Governor DeSantis did. Um, just let's address all of that in the same bill that we address campaign finance, which is going to take away the power of big interests to dominate the political field. Now, this again is another area where everybody, Republicans, independents, and Democrats can all come together because everybody wants toxins out of your drinking water. You want clean air, clean water. We want a clean lagoon. Um, we don't want um, antibiotics and hormones in our meat, which are making people sick, causing breast cancer, phosphates added to meat to plump it up, make it look a better color, adding saline, and then the phosphates and the saline both being bad for your kidneys and dialysis being so expensive that the federal government has to pay for it. All of these things, um, labeling of genetically modified food, so many things that everybody wants, you're not going to get there with very small government because you've got to have people to take care of this. You've got to have enforcement you've got to have fairness. You have to make sure everybody's analyzing it to make sure it's fair. But um, to achieve all of this, um, we have to have campaign finance reform so that big pharma and big food, big ag cannot dominate the process. Okay. Well, I mean, it, it, you seem to be very impassioned about a number of subjects. And I think that that's good to, you know, because we have such a diverse county uh, with people that have a lot of different um, needs, but also the same needs, you know, as well, just as, as human beings living on the Space Coast, um, you know, everybody travels across the Indian River Lagoon, we live on the beach, you know, people are worried about climate change, people are worried about hurricanes. Um, and to give another example, homelessness, mm -hmm. some people don't want to be on the street. Some people, some people want to get off the street. Some people need a place to live. Some people want to avoid ending up on the street. And then other people don't want to be exposed to poverty, to see the desperation of poverty as you drive down the highway. 
see people sleeping in the bushes, which we do have in Brevard County. Everybody knows about it. Let's talk about it. Let's think about doing something about it. Um, it takes tax dollars. It takes donations too, but tax dollars are certain to take care of people. And as they say, it's a lot easier to keep a person off the street than it is to get them back into their home after they've landed on the street. And, and, and think about this too. If somebody, our, our wages have been depressed year, decade after decade after decade. There's been a greater divide between what the wealthy make. I mean the uber wealthy. I don't make, mean the average person working really hard and having a nice house with a three car garage. Not what I'm talking about. Um, there, there's such a divide in wages that the lowest people, the lowest incomes cannot survive without supplementation from the federal government. Well, that is a subsidy to the wealthy, to the corporations to pay for their employees. They need to take care of their own employees. So this whole thing about, oh, just work harder, work more, don't be lazy. That'll keep you off the street. No, it's not sufficient. There's a lot more going on here um, and I intend to do something about it. We, we definitely are facing a new pandemic of a, affordable housing crisis. And we don't just mean, you know, low budget housing. We just mean being able to afford to live, you know, in this current economy. And a lot of it has to do with insurance rates and state issues. But what do you think is one of the driving causes that's driven the cost of living so high in, in Florida? Well, um, Right now, there are some companies that, I mean, everybody knows there's the Airbnb business. And just for lack of a better word, just to use that to describe all of them, I know there's a lot of other businesses where their corporations are owning businesses and renting them out for profit. And owning the houses. Owning the houses and renting them out. And this is really driving up the price so that um, people can no longer afford them anymore. We don't want to have houses only for the wealthy or houses only for the middle class and then the lower class not be able to afford because now corporations are trying to profitize those homes. Um, but that's what we have right now. Some corporations own thousands of homes and we need to ban that practice um, that needs to be adjusted. And so you know that several years ago, many, well, it's been a while now, it, um, we had the housing, we had the economic crisis in around 2006, 2008, and that was caused by mortgages being securitized. Well, now the very homes are being securitized and it's another rigged system that is going to result in a calamity and we have to legislate away from things like this. This is exactly like the market cannot go this way because the federal government then has to support the people and today it's them, tomorrow it's these people too and sooner or later it catches the rest of us. Um, so we have to we have to take action legislatively to stop houses from being securitized on Wall Street or being owned um, by mega corporations that own thousands of homes. Well, Sandy, we definitely thank you for throwing your hat in the ring. It's, it's always a uh, commendable when anyone puts themselves out there to run for office. People really don't understand how much of an undertaking it is until they actually do it themselves. So we appreciate that. What's coming up on, for you on the campaign trail? Do you have any events coming up? Where can people find you? Well, you can find me um, on my website at sandykennedyforcongress.com. Okay. And I have a Facebook page. It's also called Sandy Kennedy for Congress, but the separate words. Gotcha. Um, follow me there because it'll help get my message out to everyone. The more people I have actually following gets the message to everyone. So if you heard something that you're interested in today, and you can also go to my website and see the rest of my issues. Um, 12 major categories, large drop downs, lots of detail, lots of innovation, lots of ideas. Right. If you see what you like, go there and then follow my campaign. Um, 
Okay. Anything else you want to add before we... I think that pretty much covers it. And as far as um, events coming up, I'm going to be footing it out house to house and talking to people and uh, just going places where people are so that I can meet people and people can talk to me and tell me what's important to them. And I can let them know about my issues. I always tell candidates the best way to find out what voters want is to go ask them. You know, That's what I intend to do. <laughs> so well, we appreciate you being here and we offer this opportunity to any candidate that's running for office to come out here and be heard and tell your positions to our audience. So thank you again, Sandy, for taking the time to be with us. Thank you so much.